Uh, as has already been said, my name is uh, Arne Martin. I answer to Arne or just whatever you like. Um, I live in Trondheim and I work at a small like, two-person agency called uh, Kvitebjørn Design Bureau. Bureau. Kvitebjørn is an old Norwegian word for uh, polar bear, so uh, it's, uh, in case you were wondering. Um, I'll be giving a talk about compiling to JS today. Um, which is um, a thing that's done a lot these days. There are many programming languages in the world, in case you didn't know. Uh, but if you're developing for the browser, there's really only one. And um, outside the world of, well, us, uh, JavaScript is not always as beloved as it maybe should be. Um, um, it's a language that has its charms, but it also has its, its quirks, and it has a, a fair share of what's, um, as you maybe know. Um, but it's not the only alternative. There are several languages that use JavaScript as a compilation target uh, that allow you to write code for the browser in whatever manner you prefer. I'll just uh, go over a few of the most common ones now. The most common one is probably something like Babel, which lets you um, write uh, JavaScript from the future and compile it down to gross old-style JavaScript of today, like our, or like our an ancestors used to write. <laughs> you can write code like that and have it compile into actual JavaScript. There's uh, TypeScript, if you like JavaScript but want the added uh, safety of having some types. There's CoffeeScript, which you can use if, if you like white space and hate everything that's good and decent in the world. <laughs> There's cl um, closure script. If your eight and nine keys are all worn out on your keyboard, that's probably what you should use. There is um, Elm, if you like Haskell, uh, which is something as rare as a friendly and useful language uh, inspired by Haskell. If you love Haskell, there's PureScript. Um, but how do all these languages work? There is some code in the language that is not JavaScript, then something happens, and then there is JavaScript code. How, how does this even work? So let's talk about compilers a bit. Uh, this next part applies to most compilers. The JavaScript part is almost um, incidental in this. Um, before we go any further, I have a small warning to you. Um, I don't really know this stuff. <laughs> I have never worked on a real compiler or did anything remotely similar to writing a real compiler. I have a a uh, degree in com computer science, but I never took the compilers class, so... You know, <laughs> just take everything that I say today with a grain or two of salt and you'll be fine. That's out of the way. What does a compiler actually do? Uh, co uh, compilation happens in several steps. Uh, w what those steps are and what they do and uh, what, what happens in each, each step usually varies a bit from compiler to compiler, but I'll try to cover the, uh, the, the, the most common case here. The first part of, of compilation is lexical analysis, uh, or uh, tokenizing, or lexing. Um, the next part is syntactical analysis. I'll go into what these mean in a bit, so you don't have to worry. There is uh, uh, AST transformation. And then finally, code generation. So what is all this? First, what are tokens? The tokenizer or lexer takes the string of your program and turns it into um, a more structured representation. It, it basically takes everything in your program. Say you have the following JavaScript program. Um, it takes every bit of that string, chops it up, and turns every piece into a token and adds it to an array. So it, that may look something like this. Every piece of the code is represented in this array. So that's tokenizing. 
These tokens are then passed, passed into um, syntactical analysis, which uh, produces an AST or an abstract syntax tree, which is uh, um, a data structure, at, like, at, a tree-shaped data structure that represent, rep represents everything in your program. So for the same um, JavaScript program, the AST might look something like this. This is a simplified example. You see there's a call expression. The function being, being called is uh, the log method on the console object. The ar argument is a uh, binary, ex binary ex expression down there. Um, uh, yeah, as I said, it, it's a bit uh, simplified compared to what you'd see in a full JavaScript AST, which usually has like where in the source code is this located and everything, so, so you can have um, source mapped and stuff. The next um, common step is transformation, which uh, converts your AST into a different AST. That usually means um, converting the AST for the language you're compiling into an AST that's more compatible with a language you're targeting. Um, and it's usually done by walking the tree. There's a, a function that walks down the abstract syntax tree and visits each node in the tree in a depth-first manner and generates a new syntax tree based on this walk. After AST transformation, there is code generation. If you're using like a, a real compiler, um, uh, what you get, the end result will probably be uh, some um, binary byte code or um, machine code. For us, uh, we get JavaScript. Um, so for, the, for, for my example, let's say you have the, this um, JavaScript function. Uh, and it, in my example, it doesn't actually compile to JavaScript. It compiles to some uh, stupid version of Lisp, but that, 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 that's uh, just an example of what, could, what it could look like. So a compiler takes your source code, breaks it up into bits, shuffles all those bits around, puts them in a tree, and creates new source code or um, binary code based on the final tree. Um, I'll make an brie a brief aside into um, something that's actually important and relevant, but I won't be covering it uh, apart from this slide. That is parser generators. Um, a parser generator uh, is another word to say, um, uh, an other way of saying compiler, compiler. Um, you define your language, uh, you, you d d define the grammar of the language you're compiling in a structured way. Um, and the compiler compiler takes this representation and generates a parser for you that will um, take in some source code and generate a uh, syntax tree or maybe even the final program. Um, for JavaScript, there, there is one called uh, JSON, which is nice. It's a thing that exists. And uh, I will not be covering it any further because I, I'm, I want to um, get to the nitty gritty details of this um, for my um, code demo in a moment. So we come now to the practical part of the um, presentation. Um, I have made a programming language for you that, will be, that we will be writing a compiler for. It is probably even simpler than the simplest programming language you could imagine. It's called the dice roller language. Um, if you played Dungeons and Dragons, um, uh, well, I haven't, but I know that there are dice involved in this game. <laughs> uh, you roll some dice, and uh, um, typically the uh, D&D players, they use like a, a jargon for this. They roll like a D6, it's a six-sided die and a d12 is a 12-sided die. So if you say 1d6, that means roll one six-sided die, like a normal die. So if you say 1d6 plus 2, that means you roll one six-sided die and you add 2, you will get a number in the range 3 to 8. If you roll 2d8 plus 5, you will get somewhere between 7 and 21. 
So what would this look like in JavaScript? Something like this, maybe? It's basically just a bunch of math at random added together. So that's the idea. That that's what we want to make. So um, we want to uh, have every step of the compiler uh, represented there. So we start with the tokenizer. The tokens for this should maybe look something like this. There are three types of tokens. There's a dice, an operator, and a number. A dice can be like 2d6 or 5d8 or whatever. Operator is plus or minus, and number is yep, guess. And the syntax tree for this would look like maybe something like this. There is an um, operator expression, which is basically an addition. And it has a left-hand side, LHS and RHS, a right-hand side. The left-hand side of the add add addition operation is a dice expression. This also has a left-hand and a right-hand side. The left-hand side is how many dice we roll, and the right-hand side is what the, or how many sides that die has. So uh, should we? Yeah, let's just try um, try 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 making this. Let's go to uh, Emacs. <laughs> Thank you, Bodil. So let's start with a tokenizer. This function should basically take uh, it's on screen, right? Yeah, should take the source code as an argument and return an array of tokens. So we start by um, setting up the tokens array. We also have a variable called uh, post that, 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 that um, will maintain our uh, position in the source code. And we return the tokens at the end of the function. OK. And what I do here is basically just to add a space to the end of the source code for technical reasons. I won't go into that. And then we basically iterate over the entire uh, string of the source code, character by char char character. Um, we set, set variable c to whichever character we're looking at right now. In between here, we'll add all the functions for generating the tokens. Um, if we get this far in the loop, um, there is something that's not been caught. Something is unrecognized or just throw a ton, uh, ton, ton, uh, type error. And that's maybe not the most friendly error messages, but uh, this is not actually a production level compiler. So, First, we check if the character we're looking at is a plus or a minus. It's a very simple case. In that case, uh, we add a new token called operator. The value of the token is the sign, so a either plus or minus. We increment our position, and we continue. Go back to the top of the loop. OK, simple. Um, there are two more types of tokens, uh, numbers and dice. Uh, we'll use the same uh, uh, piece of regex to identify both. So we, we, we set up that regex here, uh, uh, a digit between 0 and 9 or uh, the, the letter D. So if the character we're looking at is matched by this uh, regex, we do the following. We keep looping and popping new characters from the source code and adding them to the current variable until um, uh, whatever we have doesn't match this regex anymore. It's basically keep going until uh, we hit the space or uh, something else, something that's not a number or a, the, the letter D. After this point, the variable current uh, holds whatever the current token is. And it may, be look, may look something like this. It could be 9, D, 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 9, 8, D, D, 9. Uh, and that's obviously not a valid dice. So we have, we have to check for that. So first, we test if it's a dice. Uh, this regex checks if the token has uh, um, zero or more digits than the letter D, then one or more digits at, at the end. OK, it's a dice. We push the dice token. Um, 
and the, uh, and the value is uh, whatever the value was. Then we check if our current token uh, is just dig digits. If it is, it's a number, fine. We push a number, beautiful. Um, otherwise, we have something that's not recognized. So we throw another type error, why not? Invalid dice expression. Okay. Uh, there is one more thing that we have to think about when we're compiling this language, and that is white space. And white space is just ignored. We just skip over it, go back to the top of the loop. So if we have anything in our program that's not a plus or a minus or a number or the letter D or a space, uh, we get this far and we get an error. Okay, that should be uh, the entirety of our to tokenizer. We can see if it works. If we have a program that's 2d6 plus 3, and we run it with our to tokenizer. Looks nice. We have a dice token, an operator token, and a number token. Beautiful. So far, so good. Now we go into the next part, which I'll call the parser, which takes our tokens uh, as an input, and this will generate uh, the syntax tree for our um, program. Um, start by defining the position, which is um, uh, our position in the tokens array. We start at the first token and we keep going through it. Um, the AST is a tree structure, not a simple array. Uh, so we uh, define a function here called walk, which will uh, create this syntax uh, tree and we'll call it uh, recursively when we get a bit further. So uh, our program should be the result of uh, calling this function. Uh, and the parser should re re return this uh, data st structure, which is the t top level AST. So the root AST node is of type program, and it has, it, it, it has the body, which is the entirety of our uh, program, which we will compile. We start by getting the current token in the tokens array. Uh, we define a variable called current, which will hold our current uh, AST node that we will create. Similar to the uh, tokenizer, if we get this far, something is wrong, and we throw a syntax error. Right. Uh, we have gotten a token from the tokens array. If the token exists and is of type number, fine, we can use that as is, in the AST, we set our current AST node to just be the number token. Simple. Otherwise, th this is more code, uh, this is uh, not as complicated as it looks. If the token exists and is of type dice, we split it in two uh, around the letter D. So we have a first part, the part before the D, and the part after, after the D, which would be two numbers. Uh, and we set our current AST node to a dice expression, which has a left-hand side of the first part of the number, or one, if there is no number defined, if it's just D6, uh, we just add one in here. The right-hand side is the number after the D. So for a two D6, the left-hand side would be 2, and the right-hand side would be 6. Okay, so far so good. Uh, what we do after this is we try to fetch another token from the tokens array, and we increment our position. If there is a next token, and the next token is an operator, or a plus or a minus, um, we return uh, a new AST node of type operator expression. The operator is the token value, so either a plus or a minus. The left-hand side of the operator expression is the current token that we created uh, in our previous part here. And the right-hand side uh, will be a recursive call to this walk function, which will then just keep 
um, lo looking at the next token in the uh, tokens array and just try figuring what the next part will be out. I think if we don't have a next token at, the, at this point, we just return the current token uh, and then the parsing is done and we have a complete AST. Okay, does this make sense? You're being very quiet. Yeah, yeah, a few <laughs>, laughs, yeah, okay. Let's try if this works. We'll try it on the same program that, that we had uh, for the tokenizer. And we'll try parsing it. Okay. Looks good. We have an operator expression with a plus. Dice expression, 2d6, and the number 3. That looks fine. We can work with this. Um, the next part of uh, a compiler from my um, uh, bullet points earlier is the uh, is, uh, AST transformation. We don't really do that for this simple language. So I'll, I'll, we'll skip over that, that, that part and go straight into um, code generation, which will take this AST and turn it into beautiful JavaScript code. Hopefully beautiful. So this generator function takes our AST uh, as a parameter. Um, here we al also have a walk function that, that will walk the AST recursively and generate code from uh, all the bits of it. Uh, at the end of our generator function, we call this walk fun function on the body part of our uh, AST. Um, this is quite simple. This uh, generator uh, function is the simplest part of the code for this co compiler. We simply do a switch over the type of the AST node. Uh, and and we, we set up a case for each node type. There's a dice expression, operator expression, and number. If we have a dice expression, uh, we do this, which is basically we create a string that contains this method floor method random uh, part as many times as there are dice. And we join that together with a plus, so we just uh, join all the maths together. Quite simple. You get this? Yeah. Sure, you do. you're smart. <laughs> if we have an operator expression, a plus or a minus, uh, we do this. Uh, we return the following string. The operator is in the middle here. And then we do a recursive call to our walk function on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the operator expression node. Should work, right? Um, if our AST node is a number, that's very simple. We just return it. So this function should take our AST and create uh, a stringified representation of our uh, program. OK. Let's see if this works. 2d6 plus 3. And we run. Yeah, you see it down at, at the bottom of the screen? Let's cut off a bit. I'll just um, move this a bit over. There you go. Looks right, yeah? Let's do 4d6. That's a much longer string. Nice. Let's do 10d6. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, now um, is the part you've all been waiting for. We'll try to run this code and see if it actually works. We just draft this whole thing in an eval. And we run it again. 10? Yeah, looks reasonable. 12? 9? 10? 11? 5? Yeah, all this makes sense, I think. Let's do some, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> 48 plus 3 plus 96. Should work too, right? Get a higher number, 46. 
Yeah. Gorgeous. I think that's my last code. Yeah. Um, okay. As far as my presentation goes, that pretty much does it. Uh, I thank you for joining me on this ride through compiler land. I hope you learned anything. <laughs> Don't use this in production ever. Um, slides are on uh, GitHub uh, if you want to look at them. Uh, I'm on Twitter. The name is up on the screen. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if, if you want to talk to me about Emacs later, just... Uh, <laughs> there were some questions about Emacs. Ah, great. Um, I like how you managed to give a presentation on abstract syntax trees and still make fun of Dungeons and Dragons as being nerdy. <laughs> that was a good trick. <laughs> well, I, I, I said I haven't played it yet because that's um, because I don't have the right friends. Yeah. That's not because I disrespect people who play oh, yeah. Dragons. Oh, yeah, that was a joke. Yeah. I, I know you don't disrespect people who play D&D. Um, another question was, what, what were your slides written in? Ah, uh, I have my own uh, custom-made terminal-based slideshow uh, thingy, <laughs> which, <laughs> which takes a bastardized version of uh, a markdown parser and generates uh, this beautiful uh, terminal stuff. From it. Does it like encode the images into terminal escape codes and all that stuff? Yes. Wow. That's amazing. Your talk was really good too. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to talk about your talk <laughs> also. But the slide thing was cool. Um, so you mentioned that you didn't take a compiler's class. How did you learn all this stuff? What resources do people use to, to get into this? Wikipedia. <laughs> okay. No, um, I just find this stuff interesting. So um, I've been looking at a few of the um, uh, compiled languages that I mentioned. I've been looking a bit into them and see uh, and looked at how they're made. And I so you'll pull open the the like the compiler for CoffeeScript. Yes, or and I, I've, I've okay. seen like the terms like tokenizer and lexer and parser and all this thrown around. So I just thought I'd look into what all this all those terms actually mean and get some. Yeah, try to do some something meaningful. Yeah, is is there a specific language that has um, kind of an approachable compiler that you would recommend people look at, or should they just check them all out? I don't know. Uh, I think the CorpusScript compiler is written in using uh, JSON, which is the um, parser generator that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, if you're writing a doing a serious real language, uh, a parser generator should be the way to go. It's my opinion. It handles uh, a lot of stuff and error cases and makes it a bit simpler. Sure. It will you, you define uh, how all your tokens look and how they are they are uh, allowed to fit together. So if you have tokens in the wrong order, you will get error messages. You get like smart error messages yes. instead of it's broken. Yes. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience was what was up with the Nyan cat in the bottom of your <laughs> Emacs? Well, yeah, that's a uh, Nyan mode for Emacs. Okay. It, it just <laughs> displays your position in the buffer. Uh, Cool. <laughs> um, one of the things I liked the most about your talk was the example language. I, I've seen a bunch of tutorials about compilers, and it seems like they're always, we will compile this simplified version of Lisp down to JavaScript, and taking something that isn't even quite a programming language and showing how you would compile it, uh, it really helped me understand, like, oh, you can apply this to anything. It's, this much more abstract thing than, than some kind of magic that generates code. Yeah, I thought about what language to use for my presentation. I thought about doing a Lisp or maybe some other like more serious language type, but I thought I'd just do the simplest thing I can think of. And that's still uh, up, like, up, up, applicable. So. Yeah, it was, that was great. Um, how, how does knowing about compilers and knowing about the tool chain that goes into them help the average web developer? Um, Say, say you're not writing a compiler for, for uh, Dungeons and Dragons or dice rolling, how would it make your life better? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, but a fun thing to do is to look into how tools like Babel and stuff works and how they do um, AST transformations. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is a fun website. I don't remember the name, but it, uh, it allows you to type in um, any JavaScript code, and it will show you the abstract index tree for that code. Oh, is that uh, AST, AST, AST Explorer yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah, I played with that. That will show you what the syntax tree will look in, like a bunch of different uh, JavaScript parsers. That's really interesting to look at. Yeah. It's, um, you mentioned Babel, and that's such a big part of the JavaScript workflow now. It yeah. seems like it might be helpful as a developer to kind of take away some of the magic of that tool that you depend on so much. And, yes, and very much. Like, someone could do that. I could do that. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your talk. Yeah. I really enjoyed Thanks. it. It was great. Thank you.